for his soul. Well, that was going to figure in later uh, to some later theology about Abyssinia. In any case, Abyssinia was never conquered largely, apparently, due to this hadith. We're not sure how accurate it is. We're never quite sure about the hadith, but uh, this is not found in al Bukhari or, or Muslim, uh, those two collections, but it is found in some other canonical collections. Leave the Abyssinians alone as long as they leave you alone. And so, um, early Muslim law uh, placed Abyssinia in a special category. You may know that uh, the world was kind of divided between uh, Dar al Islam, where Muslims ruled, Dar al uh, Harq, the realm of war, uh, where the pagans reigned, and where it was possible to carry out jihad. Abyssinia was, had its own category, Dar al Hiyad, uh, neutrality. Instead, uh, over the course of uh, several centuries, Muslims settled on the coast as traders, uh, and then gradually they migrated uh, inland, south of Abyssinia, uh, and established certain kingdoms. They weren't able to unite, however, but they, they had uh, peaceful relations most of the time with Abyssinia through trade and intermarriage. However, uh, things began to change as the centuries passed. Some Muslim traders themselves went into Abyssinia and settled there, intermarried with some of the Christians. Uh, as economic times got tough, uh, the cross-border skirmishes began to develop. And finally, uh, the Ethiopian <coughs> king in the 14th century invaded the kingdoms, uh, established his own puppet rulers, and so controlled the territory. And they had the upper hand, the Christians had the upper hand um, for quite some time, uh, for a couple of centuries. And then the, this uh, conflict developed a new, or, or fed into a new kind of thinking about uh, Abyssinia from the Muslim point of view. They went back to this tradition about uh, the original Negus and how he became a Muslim. And they said, well, then Abyssinia should be part of the Dar al Islam. But in fact, the later kings did not carry on the, uh, his, his Islamic uh, commitment. And so, because they reverted back to Christianity, therefore, Abyssinia should now be in the realm of war. Well, this is part of the ideology that led in the 16th century to an invasion of, of Ethiopia by these Muslim kingdoms to the south. They were led by Ahmed bin Ibrahim, a charismatic Muslim ruler. He was able to unite the Muslim uh, kingdoms. He was known as Ahmed Granya. Granya is um, is an Amharic for left hand. Uh, he held his sword. And he invaded Abyssinia with his army. He pulled in a number of Somali and Afar soldiers as well. And it was a watershed in, in the history of Christian Muslim relations in Ethiopia. Abyssinia was almost wiped out. In any case, there were hundreds of monasteries and, and churches that were destroyed. Uh, thousands were forced to convert to Islam. And it was only finally because the uh, Abyssinian king uh, appealed to the Portuguese for help. And they came with their rifles and bullets and shot Afangrania and the uh, invasion disintegrated. But it left Abyssinia uh, in, 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 bad, in a bad situation. Many had become Muslims uh, because of the forced conversion. Uh, the king himself remained Christian in, in the court, and the church remained intact, but it barely survived. And it's led to what scholars have called the Ahmed Rania Trauma, that the Christians said never again we're never going to allow this to happen again. And it's kind of colored Christian attitudes 
in Ethiopia uh, ever since. So I have what we call a subsequent history as a reverse Dhimma. I think we're familiar with Dhimma as the, uh, what's it's usually translated as protected status. It doesn't really cover the term, but um, the situation in the early uh, Muslim conquests whereby Christians and Jews uh, were uh, allowed to remain in their communities under a number of restrictions, but uh, in a setup that was you know, for medieval times not so bad, but still uh, somewhat suppressed. Well, it was a reverse situation in, in Abyssinia. All right, 17th century, this, these are just some of the main examples. The king decreed that all Muslims must live in separate ghetto areas. And of course, they were much uh, economically much poorer. Uh, Emperor Chodras in the 19th century tried to eliminate Islam. He was not successful. Uh, his successor, Johannes IV, this was a bit more serious. The Edict of Boru Meda required all Muslims to convert or be killed. And there's one instance where up to 20,000 Muslims were, in fact, killed. Um, his successor, Menelik, then expanded the borders to become what is now Ethiopia and incorporated all these Muslims into his country, but they were continued to re remain as second-class citizens, leading to for, for many, the kind of resistance ideology. The Oromos are the largest of the ethnic groups in Ethiopia. Uh, about half of them now are, are Muslims. And um, uh, it's thought that some of them, some have argued that uh, many became Muslims precisely because they did not want to become Christians, the, um, as they saw the oppression against Muslims. There were a few 20th century opportunities uh, for Muslims. A very interesting one, this Lijias, who was one of the Ethiopian emperors, uh, who actually apparently converted to Islam, uh, didn't last long. Uh, the church resisted that and deposed him uh, very, rather quickly. When the Italians came, uh, before World War II, uh, they used this divide and conquer strategy, and so um, supported the Muslims against the Christian government of Haile Selassie. Very good Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> Very good Catholics. <laughs> um, and so uh, the Muslims were very glad. Uh, the Italians had many mosques built, but then when Haile Selassie was restored to power, uh, many of them were punished for that. And then Somewhere along the line, the um, Derg, or Marxist regime, was mentioned. Uh, initially, uh, they supported the Muslims, uh, but uh, later all religion was suppressed. So each of these opportunities kind of ended in a bad way. It was only finally in 1991 with the current government, the EPRDF, uh, under now Prime Minister Lelis, uh, where uh, finally Muslims have received uh, a measure of, of equal status. The new government um, detached itself from the Orthodox Church for the first time in its history. Um, There's a policy of religious freedom. It's enshrined in the 1994 Constitution that Muslims are equal and they've made um, Muslim community has, has utilized this newfound freedom to uh, make themselves known. Some have said they've grown in number. Probably not, really. Uh, probably they just kind of come out of the woodwork. Uh, and their presence is much more evident. In any case, there are many new mosques and organizations, literature, and they become involved in politics as well. But perhaps most important is the uh, opening of, of channels to the outside world, uh, other Muslim countries, especially Saudi Arabia.